Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. Oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. Everyone, welcome to the Stick to Wrestling podcast. My name is John McAdam. This is Stick to Wrestling, uh, a classic wrestling podcast where if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. Before I start getting into this today's show, uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. I want to thank everyone who contributed to the Stick to Wrestling podcast. If you would like to contribute to this free, no commercials podcast, use PayPal and donate to ProWrestlingArchives at gmail.com. We're going to talk about WrestleMania 14 today is the last WrestleMania we're going to talk about tentatively until next year, and I hope you've all enjoyed the countdown. 98 is about as far forward, usually, as Stick to Wrestling goes, because we'll talk about this during the podcast. The business was changing dramatically from the wrestling that we usually talk about. But anyway, if you want to join our Facebook group, it's a lot of fun. Good wrestling talk, good all kinds of all over the place talk. Uh, just look it up and join. I will let you in. If you want to follow me on Twitter, just go to Twitter and follow. Uh, search John McAdam. Follow the guy with the Stick to Wrestling logo as his avatar. And with that, I want to bring on a brand new guest making his maiden voyage here on the Stick to Wrestling podcast. Greg Savarese. Greg, good to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. Indeed, I am a first timer, but I feel oddly at home because basically for all of my conscious life, despite a host of medications and a litany of ointments, I have somehow remained stuck to wrestling. No place Thank I'd rather be. Thank you very be. much. You mentioned that uh, you're a little bit younger than me, which pretty much covers the planet Earth. Uh, you mentioned that you are <laughs> an original Hulkamaniac. Indeed. I, I got... I made my bones, uh, you know, I was about nine years old in 1984. So I pretty much tracked my fandom to that Genesis. I remember so I, I'm, I've studied up on the Backlund era and I do remember some of that, but um, I really was taken in by, by Hulkamania and was committed nonstop. I've never missed a WrestleMania for, you know, since, since it, be, since it began. I, we're going to talk about WrestleMania 14. I watched it live. I actually did not go to the event at, in Boston, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I mean, w- this represents a big change in wrestling, Greg. In 1984, Hulkamania came to the WWF and went national, and pro wrestling had a brand new audience. A lot of the old audience was actually being pushed away. Now it's 1998, 14 years later, and once again, the the wrestling world has a new audience, and it's kind of leaving the old audience behind. But in a way, I understand that because the old audience just wasn't tuning in. They just weren't buying tickets. They weren't buying pay-per-views. And this this new audience that had been that had been ushered in was going nuts for the WWF and WCW. They were buying merchandise. I mean, this WrestleMania was the highest grossing event in pro wrestling in North America since the WrestleMania at the Sky Dome. So. We're seeing a turnaround here. It is a turnaround. I also feel that it's like a combination of of two movements um, in that you have, on one hand, exactly the way you're talking about it, they were generating a new audience on the uh, on the new the new not the new generation that's uh, several years prior, but the new era and the uh, you know the different you know rating that that uh, this would give the different kind of content, but also. I feel that they did maintain, at least as far as my generation goes, the Hulkamania generation. We were we were young kids at that time, and you know we were the audience that were picked up largely in the eighties. Now, fast forward ten, fifteen years later, we're now early twenties. We're in that prime age of spending money, of of having that income that didn't need to go to taking care of our families. Uh, serious jobs and mortgages and the and and the like, and we were, you know, up for that kind of content at that point of our lives. So I believe that they maintained a lot of the, a lot of the '80s prime audience that they were generating, and then combining it with more that were into the more entertainment uh, level of uh, of content that that they were putting up at that time. 
It was just your generation and, and some of the older ones that were that were being you know kind of pushed out. Yeah, it was. I mean, like I said, the the audience was changing. The the, the product itself was changing. I mean, I watched the Raw that aired six days before this WrestleMania, and they were doing crazy stuff. Like, I mean, we're not just talking about like Sable having her evening gown torn off to reveal you know stockings and garters. <laughs> we have Kane. Showing supernatural powers, and he he invokes a lightning bolt from the sky that sends a well. It was a stunt man, but he was playing a, a member of the camera crew, and Kane set the guy on fire. Like this was unthinkable. It's just eighteen months prior. Yes, it's it's not. It's it's certainly not uh, G rated content. Uh, the you know back in the eighties, uh, you know the most uh, uh, you know daring uh, content you know, would have been delivered by Lou Albano. You know, there's nothing like that. You know, this was far more racy. And it was also how they competed with WCW at the time. It was the the card that they could play that Ted Turner would not. Good point. That really is a good point about Ted Turner. Yeah, ECW was cha- had changed the industry. WCW was becoming a lot more racy. And the WWF was like, okay, everyone, hold my beer. Watch what we're going to do. Exactly. And they had the... They had the star power and the the talent to to do just that, but they could also back it up in the ring uh, on, on a level that they they really didn't do as much. In no, the they games. didn't. So you still had you know tremendous performers just with these these crazy storylines. Yeah, I mean, we reviewed WrestleMania uh, nine last week, and I mean, it is a completely different product than it was from WrestleMania nine. I can't overstate that, and. It's funny, like in WrestleMania 9, they brought back Hulk Hogan. They put the title back on him. It was almost like they were trying to relive the past, and they just couldn't do it. Now, WrestleMania 14, five years later, they are officially entering into a new era with Steve Austin, who's kind of the anti-Hulk Hogan, as the face of the company. Yes, that's absolutely correct. I would I would say that WrestleMania 9 was pretty much the nadir of, of my fandom. Uh, in that they were kind of in between. They didn't know exactly which direction to go. They tried to go back to Hogan, and it, it failed spectacularly. Next couple of years, while I love Bret Hart uh, more so than most, you know, they, they were trying to find his find their way. 14, they found it, uh, and it was... It was with this kind of content, and it was definitely with Steve Austin leading the Yeah, world. it had been an interesting year. Steve Austin had turned babyface at the previous WrestleMania, and they had kind of spent the entire year building up to, I mean, WrestleMania 14 was going to be Steve Austin's coronation. Exactly, and I, I also think, I mean, you had the SummerSlam before that in the Meadowlands, uh, which I was also at, where uh, Austin had that terrible injury. And I think, you know, the fact that he was able to recover was obviously fortuitous, but it it necessitated uh, and it emphasized the fact that they needed to pull the trigger on this now because you didn't necessarily know how much he would recuperate and how how long he could. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll talk about this a little bit later. It almost felt like. They waited too long. Like, I know they wanted to do it at WrestleMania, and I do know that Steve Austin suffered the injury at SummerSlam, but it felt like a year of just them waiting to put the title on Steve Austin. Yeah, it was a a lot of anticipation, Uh, no question. They kind of, yeah, with with him having a secondary title, the IC title at that time, you know, was was not the best placeholder for him. Uh, but sure, you wanted to have that coronation at the. No, Steve of Austin is Intercontinental Champion. His feet were just way too big for those shoes. Uh, I, again, I watched the the Raw leading into this, and I was reminded for the first time of a, in a while to Generation X, which was Shawn Michaels, Triple H, China, and Mike Tyson had a public workout with Steve Austin at Faneuil Hall in Boston. And I forgot how big that played locally until I saw it, you know, them advertising on it on Raw. They got coverage from every news station in Boston, like big time coverage. And it looked like the WWF had really broken through. Yeah, now that was a, a immense event. I lived and breathed that at the time because I was I was just down the road. Uh, I was I was in attendance for that workout and there were 
there were just people for as far as the eye yes. could see. Yes, I mean, there were thousands of people who came out for it. You went to WrestleMania 14. Uh, you were living in Boston at the time. I did not, and I didn't attend. Uh, I was living in Drake at Mass, so I'm about a half an hour away. And the only reason I can think of that I didn't go was, I mean, really, the, it drew like 19,500 people, and they were just 19,000 more people who wanted to go more than I did. I have no other explanation. I got you. Well, hey, uh, I was one of those 19,500 people. and Third row. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a... It, it's it's just a difference in perspective. I was a senior in college the, the season before, and I was uh, I was applying to law schools at, at the time. And once I heard that WrestleMania 14 would be in Boston, I knew that's where I had to end up. Uh, you know, Boston College was was ultimately where I went. It was also uh, helpful that Boston College Law School was the only law school that admitted me. But details bogged down the story. Uh, I was destined to go there and destined to be at that WrestleMania. There was no two ways about it. I I like the way you look at that. It was a a calling of destiny. All right, we're going to run down the show. And uh, this is is a a nothing match that somehow I have a lot to say about. They opened up with a tag team battle royal. Battle royals tend not to be very good, and this was not an exception. And I didn't know this was coming, but I I was watching this in my living room. And I see the Road Warriors, who are now LOD 2000. They have new outfits, new haircuts, and they come to the ring with Sonny, who we didn't really realize at the time, but she was on she was on her way down in the wrestling business. She was considered, you know, just a major hot talent just a year or two before, and she kind of. Let's just say Sonny had already peaked, and I saw this, and I'm not always right when I when I make this observation, Greg, but I see them coming down with Sonny with the new outfits, and I was like, this is not going to work. Yeah, it was the last gasp in for many levels. I mean, you kind of felt that way with, with the LOD. Uh, you didn't necessarily know that about Sonny, but it, you know, it was kind of desperate you know, in a lot of ways. So I, I saw the Raw... Uh, maybe a month before where they had the breakup angle between Hawk and Animal. Mm-hmm. And it didn't necessarily make you want to see a blow off match between them. It just kind of made you sad. Yeah. You know, that that this 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 great team, uh, you know, just couldn't really keep up anymore. What made me sad more than anything, okay, they had booked them prior to this uh, with a feud with uh, the New Age Outlaws. And I understand what they were doing. Like the old talent needs to put over the new talent. But in that feud, they made the Road Warriors look, you know, completely washed up. Guys who, you know, they had seen their day in the sun and were, were really no longer able to compete. And after all of that, they brought them out with this. And again, my reaction was, okay, the I'm sorry, guys, you, your first. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Your first ballot Hall of Famers, no questions asked, but your time is over. Like, I, I, I was done feeling sorry for them, and now I'm just like, okay, guys, it's time to go home. And it reminded me of a story from 1985. The Road Warriors were, you know, this hot young team. They were wrestling in Pro Wrestling USA. This is end of 84, early 85. And one of their opponents in a squash match was Ken Lucas. And Ken Lucas had been a star in his prime. And now he's on the other end of the broom. He's putting guys over. And he wanted to get some offense in in the match. The Road Warriors wouldn't have it. And they got back to the dressing room. Road Warrior Hawk punched Ken Lucas in the face and broke his nose. And I think this was the last we ever saw of Ken Lucas. And now I'm thinking, okay, Road Warrior Hawk is now on the other end of that broom. He's the guy at the end. And... In a way, it felt like I don't have anything bad to say about the Road Warriors, but it felt like we got a little bit of, of a come up it's delivered. Yeah, they certainly had it coming the way they treated a lot of a lot of both uh, preliminary workers and and legends on their way up. But there's you know there's a difference between getting someone over and uh, being exposed. Yes. And the LOD was definitely exposed there by the new age outlaws and just the entire tenor of, of where the business was going, but they, they weren't even, they weren't even the worst example of that. You got the rock and roll express in the same match right there. 
You know what? True, but the the Rock and Roll Express, and I did see them. And I was kind of like, oh boy, middle aged Rock and Roll Express. Um, but they were just kind of there. It was almost like they had this match specifically to try to repackage the Road Warriors, and it's it's like repackaging two day old su- old sushi. It's not going to work. That's right. No, the spell the spell will last longer than those two days. And but lo- looking at the teams in this match, there was no one else could have won this battle royal. Like there was no contenders. It was all just flotsam and jetsam uh, from from the company. No, you're you're absolutely right. That's why at the time I was a little bit turned off because I was like, okay, we're dedicating this battle royal to it being the Road Warriors show. And you know, again, I'm not saying anything bad about the Road Warriors, but you know, Father Time remains undefeated, and the Road Warriors were clearly done here. And it was kind of a waste of a, a possibility of pushing someone else. Like I said, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, this isn't going to work. Yeah, yeah. No, I I generally like battle royals. Not because they're quality matches, but because looking at the competitors in them so a lot of times can give you a good sense of what the company is at that point of time. Roy- I feel that way about Royal Rumbles, definitely. But like this one, it just screamed that while the WWF was on their way up at that at that point, there was really very little depth. Uh, you had 30, 30 guys in that in that match. And so few of them really amounted to to a lot, um, you know, at, at any point. Uh, you, you could, if you did a top 10 of least likely wrestlers to ever appear at a WrestleMania, half of them would be from this match. I, I have to agree. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was basically the Road Warriors and a bunch of fi- uh, filler guys. But next we have a segment where the WWF is, I mean, basically it, it's in big capital letters. Look how mainstream we are. We have coverage from the New York Post and the New York Times. We were on this national television show and it was a big event in Boston. And uh, while I, I guess it's important to put that out there, but there was just nothing subtle about it. It was basically the WWF just showing off that like you know hey we're mainstream like the nfl or major league baseball which they weren't but i mean you gotta put the message out there once they got tice involved in in the event i i feel like they had to take you know had to shoot their shot so to speak uh that that got them some legitimacy on sports center at a time when everyone was watching sports center and i think they milked that to the hilt vince does nothing halfway Let's talk a little bit about Mike Tyson and the celebrities in general. We'll go more into that. But people forget, you know, Mike Tyson has become embraced once again in general by American society. Mike Tyson was was an was absolutely disgraced by this point. It was almost like some people were saying it's an embarrassment that Mike Tyson is lowering himself to doing this. Other people were saying it's an embarrassment that the WWF is dealing with this person. He had just gotten out of jail on an aggravated rape charge. He bit uh, Evander Holyfield's ear off during a boxing match. And, you know, he was definitely down on his luck at this point, yet he was still a key component to getting this WrestleMania over. He was definitely a pariah, and the but the ultimate in... I don't want to say hate watching, but someone that you really need to see just to view what would happen. And this was almost a perfect vehicle for that kind of a celebrity. I mean, for so long, the WWE had, I'm I'm using WWE and WWF interchangeably. I mean, if a panda comes and eats half the roster, (laughs) that'll be why. But the, they had for so long used D list and, and, you know, not disgrace, but just not famous enough celebrities uh, to, you know, to heighten WrestleMania, but this was the top of the mountain for for that kind of category at this point. It really was, and they were using the kind of celebrities that they never would have used in the past, and once again, we'll get more into that in a couple of minutes. Next, we have a cruiserweight match uh, between Taka Michinoku and Aguila. Aguila was a guy, he could do some stuff, but he really didn't know how to wrestle. That's, yeah, I, I have this in my notes. It's it's nonstop spots. It's a spot fest. Yes. And there are some there's some really good spots. There's a sky twister press in here that I don't think I've seen on a WrestleMania before or since. But there's no there's no psychology, there's no flow uh from one move to the other, there's no transitions. And that's I mean, Taka is a is a good enough worker, but uh Aguila 
was was in, I, I don't even know how old he was at this point. Um, and he was probably the best person for this for this spot, but didn't say much for their cruiserweight division. He was 19, at least according to Jim Ross's uh, commentary. You know, one thing I, I used to tell indie wrestlers, uh, I actually, I would tell them, like, don't let anyone associate you with a cruiserweight or a junior heavyweight because that's something that just never goes away. The, the fans will always see you as a guy who's too small. Like uh, Brian Pillman got over it. But I remember when they started uh, pushing him as a, a junior heavyweight or a cruiserweight. I was like, they're killing this guy's career. And I, I just don't think that, I mean, it never really got over in the United States the way it should have. And I always go back to my sign to my Jerry Seinfeld quote when he says that here's what pro wrestling is. It's really big guys who pretend to fight. And in the United States, it just seems like that's what what people want. They want their really big guys. They don't want the they don't want to see these 185 pound guys. And I, and I think that is only exponentially more the fact in the. You know, traditional Northeast territory yes. of the WWF and, and, and who they were pushing. I mean, it wasn't just 250 pounders, it was 300 pounders. So the fact that you had a light heavyweight championship uh, in, in this match, in this show, really stood out like a sore thumb. You know, and, and, and you could also compare it to what they were doing on Monday Nitro, uh, where they had effectively used luchadors and, and light heavyweights in that category and and they had the same problem that few very few busted out of that but at the same time Aguila and and Taka for that matter you know if they were in WCW at that time they wouldn't have been better than the top dozen let's say uh that that were in that division no not even close and you know what i just thought of this i used to like the junior heavyweight matches and one of my friends was like look I don't want to see Nadia Kamenichi fight Mary Lou Retton. <laughs> that was his <laughs> quote, and that's how he felt about the junior heavyweights. And that's kind of the attitude that most of North America had. I know, you know, some people like them, and they got over in some places. The newsletters like them, but I'm saying the fans in general did not. Speaking of celebrities, <laughs> I, once again, I watched the Raw, the the Go Home Raw, and there was this woman, this a middle-aged woman who was kind of making sexual innuendos. I'm like, who the hell is that? It was Jennifer Flowers. And I I think I'm going to have to explain who this was. Bill Clinton was president in 1998. And while Clinton was campaigning, this woman comes out and says that she has had a, a, has been having a multiple year affair with the then governor of Arkansas, and now she's at WrestleMania. And like I said, I when I saw her, I didn't know who she was, and then they finally told me who she was, and now she's having this segment with The Rock, and it was just, it was terrible, I thought. It was it was super campy. I thought The Rock did the best he could with it. Yes. And this is like still kind of proto-Rock. He's still very early in his trajectory. But at the same time, I thought he made it fun. Uh, Jennifer Flowers was the that was the quintessential you know d-level disgrace celebrity uh to have there you know uh she, she made pete rose look you know top of the top of the mountain <laughs> but um it was you know it, it, it was uh you know quite a spectacle uh just to see that confluence I, i'd love for someone to ask rock about that now yeah really i i don't even know who to compare Jennifer Flowers, like the 2023 version of Jennifer Flowers. I have no idea, but talk about someone who got their 15 minutes of fame and just completely disappeared. I mean, I I hadn't thought of her in in a a decade at least. Yeah. Yeah. I would say um, like uh, if you remember Gary Hart, uh, presidential uh, nominee uh, or at least candidate in the, in the eighties in the Reagan era, uh, Donna Rice, uh, that would, be the one that uh, brought him down. Uh, that's the best I could do. And, you know, Donna Rice isn't uh, headlining WrestleMania 1 by any stretch. <laughs> no, she was not. Okay, so next next matchup, we have, well, after the Jennifer Flowers segment, I agree, The Rock did his what he could to carry that. But, yeah, you're right. I'd love to see someone bring that up with The Rock. We have Triple H and Owen Hart. And here's the thing, the WWF, it, it's changing so much. Triple H is supposed to be the heel. Owen is supposed to be the baby face. But we have Triple H. He is cool, and Owen Hart is not. And 
Sergeant Slaughter is the uh, is the commissioner or the authority figure, and he's super nerdy, handcuffed to China. I mean, it's almost like they they it's almost like they want the heels to be cheered. Yeah, and you don't know whose influence that was. I mean, you you certainly know that that's a that's a click thing mm-hmm. uh, where they're the cool heels and and Paul and Nash had that going on in the, in the other company as well. But, you know, who's really benefiting from that? I mean, in actuality, Owen Hart uh, as being the last uh, of, of the Hart dynasty in the company at that time, after what they did to his brother, mm-hmm. he should have maintained his heat. He should have, you know, been way up there atop the cut, higher, higher than he was in this match. And they, they kept, you know, pulling his legs out from under him, you know, literally kicking the leg out of his leg uh, <laughs> to to steal a prior WrestleMania term. But um, yeah, he Triple H was was on the ascent clearly, and he wouldn't spend much longer as a heel, as it turned out. No, and you know, Owen, I felt bad for Owen. I mean, it was you know, Owen against DX was the most natural thing in the world, and Shawn Michaels just wasn't going to let it be big. It was that simple. But I mean, I, one thing I noticed: both China and Triple H are from right here in Nashua, New Hampshire, about a half an hour north of Boston. This had to be a dream come true for both of them. Not only being on WrestleMania, but being at, at WrestleMania on their home field. You would think so. I imagine Killer Kowalski was beaming with pride you know, <laughs> over his uh, over his vegetarian plate or you know his, his photography or something along those lines. <laughs> Have you ever met Walter Kowalski? I I did. I did. I, very I, briefly. Could, I can just tell you met him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a frightening guy. I mean, you, you never heard someone speak so menacingly about uh, about being a vegetarian and, and, and <laughs> photography. <laughs> they fr- frightened me of the entire medium. There you go. All right. So the next matchup, we have Mark Merrow and Sable against Gold Dust and Luna. Now, one the, the first thing I had to say about this match was this was way, way better than I thought it could possibly be. And I give Sable credit. She did a good job in there, uh, even though she'd never wrestled before. I mean, you could just tell she did kickboxing for cardio and just use it in this match. She had tremendous. She- I agree with you entirely. Uh, I don't think anyone had any reason to expect her to have both the capability and the fire. She had real baby face fire that she showed there. She did. And her, I mean, Luna's a professional and was the perfect foil for her. But the shots that Sable took at gold dust, uh, that's, I feel that that's what really got her over. Every time she was near him, she'd smack him in the face. And to, to, to Dustin's credit, uh, his his reactions were were pure and wonderful. This was such a fun match. It really was. One thing about I noticed about Goldust slash Dustin, he had put on a ton of weight since the last time I I watched a a show he was on. I mean, I don't know what was going on with him, but he was getting heavy. Yeah, no, he had a he had a steadily descent at this point. I remember he was kind of. Uh, I mean, he was maybe the artist formerly known as Gold Dust. Like, I don't know, the bloom was kind of off the rose. And and it's, I mean, it's interesting because you could say the same thing about Mark Merrow, not not physically, but you know, he never uh, got into the heights that uh, that they would have thought for him when they signed him initially a few years prior. He had a big injury, and uh, you know, he he, you know, the best thing about him when he came back was his wife. He's kind of like the anti macho man in that way. Uh, he, he couldn't hold up his end, yet this match uh, showcased the best out of all of them. No, Mark Merrow wrestled the best match I had ever seen him in. I mean, he had he was up for this match. He looked really good here. Yeah, he, he, if you feel like he had something to prove, both in terms of coming back from injury and where his position in the company at that point, and and they all they all work together. It's it's kind of a moment in time because I don't know that I don't know that Sable had a had a great moment since then, but it was it was such a a great spot, great reaction. I would say from being in the building that night, the pop for Sable and the chance for her, she probably got. The second or third uh, top reaction of the night. There was a rumor going around at the time that Sonny put a bug in Luna Vachon's ear to have her hurt Sable 
uh, during this match. It's just a rumor. I'm not saying it's true. And supposedly uh, it got to the point where Luna was taken aside. So if anything happens to Sonny in this match, you're, you're gone. You're fired as of right now. Yeah, no, I, Luna is a total professional. I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. I know that uh, Sonny is, uh, you know, probably was was looking looking behind her a bit uh, with Sable hot on her heels. Uh, you could certainly understand that sentiment, but um, you know that that might be a Iron Sheik breaking Hulk Hogan's leg scenario. It really might be. I I put both. I, I'm the one who put the rumor out there, and I actually don't believe it. But I do believe they told Luna Vachon that if Sable gets hurt, you're gone. You have to protect her. It would make sense. I mean, there there weren't. A lot of instances back then, of, you know, versus now, where you had severely undertrained people you know, working matches. Uh, that was one of the earlier times that I can think of uh, where, where that would have happened. Yeah, and I'll, once again, I give Sable credit. She was in good shape, and she did not bring that match down at all. All right, now we no. get to The Rock versus Ken Shamrock. As workers, neither guy is really there yet. You have both of them had a ton of athleticism, but and they could do certain things. But I didn't. I thought it was a good match, but not a great match. I, I enjoyed this match. I thought it was too short. You're you're absolutely right. There was something missing with each uh, each participant. Uh, the Rock obviously found it. I don't think that Shamrock ever did. I, I think going in, I think Shamrock might have been at a slightly higher level than The Rock. Uh, in that you could you could I could have easily seen them running with Shamrock and 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 keeping him on a main event level. They just they just never did, and you know, The Rock continued his ascent. No, Shamrock, when they first signed him, when they first put him on television, I thought, okay, they have finally found their their new Hulk Hogan. It turned out that the guy who was closer to that was, was Shamrock's opponent in this match. I mean, people had been raving about uh, Dwayne Johnson since he was wrestling in Memphis as Flex Lavender. And you know, uh-huh. supposedly everyone was like, oh, my God, this guy's going to be huge. And it happened. I mean, he, you know, he's he outgrew the wrestling business a long, long time ago. Yeah. And the trajectory is amazing. And you can really it's its launch point was not that far before this. I mean, it was really with the heel turn. But like if you think back a year ago at WrestleMania 13, the Rock's jerking curtains with the Sultan. <laughs> and you know he needed his dad he needed rocky johnson there just to keep him as a baby face just to get a pop at all uh so to go from that to where he is here you know really holding up his end and maintaining the heat for the match is is pretty incredible and it obviously it, it didn't stop there no and once again we're talking about the company changing i mean you know the survivor series 96 the, he debuted as rocky maivia with that look and i want i want to turn the show into me saying i knew this wasn't going to work and it didn't but that was another time like i knew something wasn't going to work and now you know here we are just a year and a half later and you know the rock is a heel and he's a cool heel yeah, and he was a cool heel the right way. Like he was cool, but he could he could show vulnerability. He didn't uh, necessarily expose his opposition. Uh, that 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 was he was built from the ground up correctly. Yeah, I, I think they made a, a, a detour along the way, but now they've they've definitely got him on the right track. And as a heel, I'm, I was saying, you know, one day he's going to make a great baby face, and he did. He he certainly did. I mean, he was he was great at at everything and. Uh, you can see the gen, and he he was able to pull a lot with him in that orbit. Uh, he he created legitimacy for everyone in that nation of domination group that you know wouldn't have and didn't have it otherwise. But I think D'Lo Brown, Mark Henry, Godfather, you know, they were all they're all they all benefited from from having him around. No, I, I agree. He helped made all of those guys careers. Now we have something called a dumpster match. It is Terry Funk and Cactus Jack against the new age outlaws. I'm, I'm looking at Terry Funk during this match. And if, if you think I got road warriors fans mad earlier, will you hear this? Terry Funk is now too old. 
He can't throw a punch. He's having a hard time getting around. The the NWA was apologizing for him practically in 1989. You know, he's middle-aged and crazy. Look at those abs. And he was fine again nine years ago. But I, I just think he, he looks too old here, and, and he just can't go anymore. You know, and I, you feel like he knew that, you know, he, he didn't just, just, I can't imagine that the, the company wanted to name him Chainsaw Charlie, you know, at that point, all Terry Funk had uh, in in many ways was his name. And you take that away from him. uh, You put a, you put pantyhose on his head and, and you give him a, a chainsaw gimmick. And, you know, now, now what is he, if you don't know that that's Terry Funk in there, you know, it's just some, it's a generic wrestler. He was somewhere in between that. Uh, coming up for this match, he didn't have, you know, he wasn't gimmicked out. He has the Funk U uh, t-shirt. But, you know, they were trying to get that last bit of juice out, and he didn't last much past this event either. No, he didn't. And, it, you know, it's funny. The way this match was booked, it has – actually, the whole feud has Terry Funk's DNA all over it. I mean, you know, th- these are clearly Terry Funk ideas. They did an angle a few weeks prior where New Age Outlaws put uh, Terry Funk and Cactus Jack. They locked them in the dumpster, and then they knocked the dumpster off the stage like 10 feet, and it made it look like both guys – you know, they basically killed both of them. They had Sonny crying – outside of it and then they kill the whole angle by having them do a run-in like an hour later maybe not even an hour later yeah that that dumpster spot that was crazy at the time i remember that when when it happened and that was like you had not seen too too many things like that that it was you know you'd seen stuff with the undertaker where they're putting him in the casket and they're raising him to the heavens you know kind of mythological stuff but this was like a real world you know, wow! They just pushed two people in a dumpster off a off of a riser to, you know, to their seeming death, and you know, them making a run in, you know, three matches later made it very difficult to suspend your uh, believability. What also made it difficult, I remember watching it and being like, okay, wow, I wonder how they pulled that off. And then you see them pulling them out of the dumpster and you see the, the packing peanuts all over yeah. the place. I'm like, you're not supposed to have that on television. Yeah, I mean, if you think that uh, that Terry Funk should have been packed in dry ice at that point, uh, showing him with all of those peanuts uh, would not have helped your cause. No, no, not at all. So anyway, I know people who freaked out over this because the match ends with, you know, two, two guys getting put, put in a dumpster and Terry Funk putting a forklift uh, using a forklift to seal the dumpster closed. I mean, you know, it doesn't get any more old school than Terry Funk, but this is definitely uh, new school going on here. Yes, yes. You had, I want to make mention of like, there were two pretty intricate, excellent spots that, that both uh, involved uh, Foley more than more than Funk. But uh, but that finish uh, that, that you're referencing, uh, it's a good thing that Terry Funk was a great wrestler because he's a terrible forklift <laughs> driver. He couldn't dip the that forklift. So, you, I mean, you see Road Dog and Billy Gunn, you know, just rolling off of it into, into that dumpster. So it, it was a, I, I thought it was an entertaining match. I enjoyed the match. It's, it again, it was still new to the the, the genre uh, in, a, in a WrestleMania. But that finish was was super lame. Yeah, it, it was, you know, it was a comedy match. And it was originally going to be Terry Funk versus Cactus Jack in some kind of like a, a Japanese hardcore match. And Vince decided that, you know, no, that's a bit too much. So we'll go with the dumpster and the forklifts, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, I, I just knew a lot of people who, who freaked out over this. And speaking of freaking out, now we've got The Undertaker versus Kane. And I just can't emphasize it enough. 18 months later, there's no way you could book a feud like this. Like, you know, the, the arena has red lighting when Kane is out there. And he sticks The Undertaker in a casket and turns it on fire. And we, we mentioned earlier about how he supposedly has supernatural powers. I, I've been a fan... At this point, for over 20 years, I've been a fan since I was 10 years old, and I admit I kind of liked it. I, I I can't explain why, but I was I, at the time I was like, okay, this is kind of cool, and some of my friends is like, no, this this isn't wrestling. You know, it it wasn't it wasn't wrestling. Like that backstory was more soap opera than anything else. But it was such that you know you had a comic book element to it. You had a a science fiction element to it that 
you could kind of keep them separate. You know, on one hand, it was a fairly well thought out story to have you know, the Undertaker, you know, seemingly murdering his family and, and setting a fire that disfigured his brother. And now he's coming back. That's a that's a horror movie. And, and yes. anyone can can appreciate that. It, you know, it, that's that's in one compartment. I mean, it was a very well thought out, detailed storyline. But like you said, it was like a, a movie, not a wrestling angle. That's right. That's right. And you can appreciate it as such. On the wrestling side, you want to see these these giants fight. They could both. You knew the Undertaker could go. Uh, you were going to learn that about Kane. Uh, he was certainly he certainly struck an imposing figure. And you know, considering the that Undertaker's previous opponents were along the lines of Sid and giant Gonzalez, like he, he couldn't, he couldn't do worse. Uh, so you had, you had a competent matchup and, and you had Pete Rose, uh, which, which threw a, I, I wanted to make sure that, that, uh, that he got mentioned in here because it was a, it was an amazing moment uh, right prior to this match. Now, for those unaware, Pete Rose was a legendary baseball player here in the United States who has been banned from baseball for about 35 years now because he bet on the sport. It's like the ultimate no-no. You can't do that. So once again, keeping with the WrestleMania is being filled with somewhat disgraced characters. Pete Rose comes out. And he starts ragging on the Boston sports scene. He says that, you know, he left tickets for Bill Buckner, but Bill Buckner couldn't bend over to pick them up. So he's not here. Amazing line. Yes. Amazing line by Pete Rose. <laughs> for, once <laughs> again, for night. those unaware, the Red Sox would have won a World Series in 1986 had Bill Buckner, had he been able to pick up a very simple grounder to first base. But I give Bill Buckner credit he was playing injured but you know that's where that's the whole background on this thing and the uh Kane comes out to his music Pete Rose looks a little bit surprised and he's got another surprise coming to him because Kane takes this man I think Pete Rose was like early late 50s at the time and gives me tombstone pile driver yeah it was it was really incredible Pete Rose fits the bill as a disgraced celebrity but he was born for that moment. Uh, he was a tremendous heel coming into the ring and delivering those lines. And I thought it was just really interesting that they had Kane be the uh, be the wrestler that gives him his comeuppance. Uh, Kane is a huge heel at that time. And there was a, just a tremendous pop. Uh, you know, ultimately, I don't think it made a difference in terms of, uh, you know, taking the heat away from the match. But it was really interesting that they chose Kane to be the person that dropped Pete on his head. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. You would think the Undertaker would be the one who would come out and do that baby face spot. But at the same time, the WWF had spent the past year, not less than a year, but they had spent a while really blurring the the lines between the baby faces and the heels. And they would, they would really get into that as 1998 progressed. That's true. I mean, Austin is the best example of that, uh, you know, being that there's shades of gray between uh, f- baby faces and heels. Uh, and, and Kane, you know, always, despite, you know, being a heel that set his brother on fire, uh, you know, maintained a degree of sympathy uh, concerning his backstory. Yes, because of the storyline behind it. You know, Undertaker was not uh, his hands were not clean in that whole scenario. That's that that is absolutely correct. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was it was kind of a moment that was separate from the match that that came in, but just was a a really entertaining spot that, that truly popped the crowd prior to uh, prior to such a huge match. You know, I remember just three years ago, I was in Barberville, Kentucky, watching Glenn, uh, Glenn Jacobs, that's his name, as Unibomb teaming Unibom. with Al yes. Snow against the Rock and Roll Express. And here three out of those four people are on the show. Uh, the the biggest show of them all, WrestleMania. Yeah, that's that's an incredible uh, incredible trajectory uh, for you know those making that show. The positions that they were in quite uh, quite to separate. Yeah, you know, I what did you think of this match, Greg? I thought it was uh, it was better than I thought it would be. It was a good big man match, not a great one, but a good one. I thought it was a solid match. I think that. At that time, uh, I think The Undertaker uh, did yeoman's work here. Uh, he was rarely involved in a match where he had to be the bumper. And and he was just that here. Kane was was the heavy. 
uh, and Undertaker flew around for him. He was selling throughout the match. And that was just something, especially at that time, you did not see The Undertaker do. So, and Kane, unlike many of the big men before him, he was able to hold up his end. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And The Undertaker, you know, he was always a good worker, maybe not a great worker, but certainly what, you know, more than you can ask for for a guy his size. Yeah, he, I mean, he always fit his role well to that point. You know, his matches with Shawn Michaels, with Bret Hart, those were excellent matches, but he was very rarely put in the position where, uh, where he was with a larger guy who could work. The only other, the only other good big man Undertaker match that I can think of up to that point was I thought his I thought his WrestleMania 12 match with Diesel was pretty good. But this one, uh, you know, Kane was able to was able to hold up uh, the the pace that they had in this match uh, for the first I'd say 60 percent uh, was was a really fast pace that you don't generally see in, in any big man match really. No, I, I uh, you know, I, again, I agree. That was a, a far better match than I thought it was going to be coming in. I remember thinking that as I was watching it, like, okay, I thought this match would be a bomb and it's not. And secondly, you know, rewatching it, it was like, hey, that was a darn good match. Yeah, no, they, they, they put it together. I mean, Undertaker had an insane plancha through, through a table. You know, I, I thought that, I thought the finish was a good finish. Uh, you know, I there, I know there's questions uh, about whether whether Kane should have been uh, jobbing clean at, at that point, but I don't think it hurt him at all. No, and, and as a matter of fact, we were asked by one of our listeners, um, you know, do you think they did the right thing? You know, because uh, having Undertaker go go over, because usually when you're having a the the start of a feud like this, I mean, if you go by the book, the heel wins the first match every time. They kind of flip the switch here. They did. I, I don't know whether they were that uh, attentive to the streak at that point, or they just they just thought that it was. You know, they Ken didn't have the credibility credibility yet, but you know, Undertaker goes over, but he it needs three tombstones to do it. Kane was able to get his heat back, and you know, Kane was was main event level for you know, almost his entire career. Past that, I don't think it did a did a drop of damage to him. You know, Greg, at this point, the streak really wasn't uh, – it wasn't even talked about. Like, I hadn't noticed that Undertaker had won all of his WrestleMania matches, but maybe that's something they were thinking about in the back of their heads. Like, okay, let's not have him lose yet. I, I, to be honest, I don't know. Yeah, I would I would think that you're right about that because if uh, if they had known that he had that streak at that time, if they were attentive to it, uh, I think Kane would have gone over because that would have been a definite way to to pull the trigger on Kane. Uh, his streak would have been like maybe seven and zero at that time, but you would have heard them sp- speak about it uh, in the Raws leading up to the show, and then that Kane could have used that for the rest of his career. Was it necessary? I th- ultimately, no, it wasn't. Uh, Kane had his uh, legacy all his own at this point. No, you're right. Him, him doing a job did did not matter as far as you know, Kane being over versus not being over, and that storyline just kept getting more and more interesting as time went on. They they would re- reunite, they would fall apart again. It was, I thought they, I thought it was good stuff. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry to the for, to the more traditional uh, members of our audience, but I liked the Undertaker Kane thing. Yeah, I, I think I think it helped that they that. He could back it up. I think it helped that they could have, you know, okay, you know, decent matches, not not five star matches, but you could have they could have entertaining matches. And, you know, so you could it would give you a little more credibility or, uh, you know, credence to come up with some wild areas of the, of the story. And it also helped that you had uh, Paul Bearer and Percy Pringle as a, as a storyteller. And it, it allowed him to be a lot more entertaining than he had been, in, you know, for years as just the droll Paul Bearer. I'll, I'll say something about this, too. I mean, we had a worst managers of the 80s show maybe two or three years ago. And I, I had Percy Pringle as the worst manager of the 80s. I thought I thought he was ah. terrible. And as Paul Bearer, he was just a guy. But as Paul Bearer with Kane in the storyline, he was fantastic. And it would not have been anywhere near as good without him. Oh yeah, no. Kane definitely needed the mouthpiece. He needed someone to tell the story. 
you know, like uh, like Andre had Bobby Heenan for WrestleMania three, and and there's so many uh, you know other examples of that, and it's it's something that's lost today. But you needed Paul Bear in that spot, and you could tell that he was, uh, you know, he was game, and 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 he he definitely held up his end as well. He did. Yeah, I mean, you use the you use the correct word. He was the storyteller in the whole thing, and he made it work. And I, I absolutely give him a lot of credit for this. Finally, we have the main event: Shawn Michaels, WWF Heavyweight Champion, wrestling Stone Cold Steve Austin. Shawn gets a lot of flack to this day, 25 years later, on the internet for various things, and he deserves them. Sean was, you know, going through, uh, he was he was going through a rough patch in the late 90s, and he was also putting other people through rough patches. Uh, but, I mean, I give him all of the credit in the world here, Greg. He was, he hadn't wrestled since the Royal Rumble because he was awaiting back surgery. His back was in incredibly bad shape, and he was playing in pain through this whole match, and yet he was still a phenomenal performer. People will often ask the kind of rhetorical question, who was better, Bret Hart or Shawn Michaels? And to me, it's always been Bret Hart, but that doesn't mean Shawn wasn't good. Shawn was great. I I think for me, at least, it comes down to, you know, if you're a Bret Hart or a Shawn Michaels guy, I'm a Bret Hart guy. No question. You know, I thought that Bret Hart was the better wrestler. His matches were more believable. Shawn Michaels was the quintessential performer. Shawn Michaels, uh, Shawn Michaels match. You knew that you were going to get the best match on the show. Almost, almost always. Shawn Michaels, I don't know, struck the fear of God in me as someone that could tear me apart. Bret Hart could tie you in a knot. Uh, that, that's, to me, that's the difference between the two. That's that's a good point, Shawn. And we talked about this last week. Could be very flippy floppy, but in the nineties, there were paper WWF pay per views that he he literally saved the show in the main event with his performances. Yeah, no, no question. I mean, you Shawn Michaels had a, a tremendous match. He he always he could steal the show. When you when you speak about you know a, a wrestler's wrestler, you know that might not be him, but it does. Yeah, it doesn't mean that that he's not you know really high on the list of people that you want to see in this spot at WrestleMania. No, it was a, it was a really it was a really gutsy performance on Sean's part and my understanding coming into this WrestleMania was that this was going to be his last match that he had plenty of money in the bank and that he was tired of being beat up and you know I remember watching it live and just being kind of sad like okay you know this is the end of the road for him and you know thankfully it wasn't Yes, yes. No, he he definitely had a had a second or third act, as you'd say. But um, yeah, I have this throughout my notes for the for the main event. Like the you know the continuing question, you know, just how injured is he? Uh, because yes, you knew going in, uh, those on the you know next level of of fandom knew that he was really injured. His he had a terrible back injury. This was going to be his last match for a while. You didn't know that he was necessarily done. But, you know, certainly for an extended period of time, he was going to be on the shelf. And, you know, there, there are spots in this match where, you know, it's old Shawn Michaels. He's he's bumping like a madman and doing his kip ups. And it's just like, this is incredible. It, but like you see when they have the shot of him, you know, just walking into uh, it backstage before he walks down the aisle. You know, he's not walking right. You know, he, he, he looks injured. And, you know, that he could turn it on and put in that performance. It's sad, but amazing all in in itself. It was. And, you know, the the word out there, as you know, as I like to put it or whatever, was that like, yeah, this was definitely it for Sean. And turns out it wasn't. I mean, you know, no one can tell the future. Uh, Someone at Kevin Waterhouse asked the question, if Michaels didn't play ball and rumor was that Undertaker would have run in, how do you think that outcome would have worked in the big picture? Now, what I had heard was that Sean, as usual, was playing games as far as you know what he was willing to do as a finisher. And supposedly the Undertaker uh, taped up his hands right in front of Sean and you know, Sean, you are catching these hands if you don't go out there and do business. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any way that Sean Michaels would have been maintained that position, considering that you could not have gotten much more out of him. Uh, and and been in that main event to put Steve Austin over. 
you know, there would have been no upside to a a Schmaz finish, uh, a you know, something where Michaels wasn't laying down and looking at the lights. So for him to be difficult at that, you know, Undertaker threatening him, doing whatever they had to do to get him in, you know, tranquilizing him and getting him in there to lay down while Austin shot no fingers at him would have been better than any other kind of finish. No, you know, in the wrestling business, there's there's a, a a term that they use out there when a guy doesn't want to do a job. It's, it's never it's never I don't want to do a job. It's never I don't want to put you over. The, the the term they use is I don't want to look bad. Don't make me look bad, which means that I you know I don't want to lose. Right, my ego's getting in the way. And at this point, Sean, you know, like I said, we all think this is it. And you got to do business on the way out. And I give him credit. Not only did he go through with everything he agreed to do, but there was something he specifically agreed, you know, said, I'm not doing this, which is when Tyson knocked him out for the fair after the match, you know, one punch knockout. And then they threw a stone cold Steve Austin 316 shirt over his face. And Shawn Michaels, before the show, you know, they told him, hey, here's what we want to do. And Shawn's like, no, I'm not doing that. And Tyson went out and did it anyway. And Shawn supposedly was furious. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, Michaels' legacy to that point was of, and he said this in many Raws prior to the match, that he's not laying down for anybody. So the fact that he did that was a major, major step for him. And sure, I mean, if he if he said he wasn't going to do that and they did it anyway, he would have been right to be furious. That's one of the few times that I, a, a Shawn Michaels, uh, you know, hissy fit might have been warranted. But all the same, the guy had to go down, and uh, and the the company had to survive and move forward. And it wasn't going to be with HBK. No, it wasn't. And it's funny, you know, you look back. Uh, WWF in, in 1998, you know, the, their big stars, the the past year was Steve Austin. Okay, he's still here. But the other two biggest stars were Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. And now they are both gone. Yeah, no, and that's right. You know, you have, uh, the, you know, the Montreal Screwjob and the, I mean, I guess contracts would not have, have changed this. But Vince McMahon was essentially having to choose between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. and you know, who knew that Michaels wouldn't last either, you know, Hart, if he had chosen Hart, you know, he could have, you know, lasted and performed and they might've put them underwater financially. But um, you, yes, you could not have predicted that, you know, neither of the top two pillars of the company at that point would be working for them past 1998. You know, it, it's funny. It, it all, it always comes back to the Montreal screw job, right? I firmly believe that even if Shawn Michaels had not been part of the issue, I firmly believe that Vince McMahon wanted Bret Hart gone. And I, I think it had less to do with his contract, although that was a factor. But I, I think Vince just wanted Bret gone. Bret was, had become too contentious. Brett want, wanted the company to go in one direction and McMahon wanted it to go in the other direction. And Brett was like standing in the way. I, I legitimately think that, that Vince just didn't want Brett around anymore. And that could very well be correct. I mean, you, you, I'd have a hard time placing, I know there's, there's some Facebook questions about this as well, but I have a hard time placing Brett Hart in the pure attitude era. I mean, he, he, as far as a wrestling traditionalist, He's closer to Bruno San Martino in terms of you know how he views uh, the, you know the art of professional wrestling versus you know the the lower uh, lower hanging fruit content that they were putting out in the in the end of the nineties. You know, something just jumped into my head. We we talked a little bit about Brad and Sean. We talked about there being a new audience. In 1999, they had uh, a show in the middle of, I don't even remember where it was, the middle, middle of the sticks, New Hampshire, where the guys who Dory Funk Jr. was, was, were, was training uh, were having a show. And they had Edge, Christian, Kurt Angle. I believe the Hardys were on there, et cetera. And I went to this. And I saw Marty Funk, Dory's wife. And I know people have varying opinions on, on Marty Funk, but here's my experience with her. I walk up. I say, hi, excuse me. Are you Mrs. Marty Funk? She's, and she's very nice. And yes. And we got to talking a little bit. 
And, you know, I talked about, you know, how much I admired Dory Funk. And, and she was she was very what's the word I was looking for? Very happy that someone had remembered her husband in a positive light. I bought I brought a magazine with me, hoping I could get Dory to sign it, which I did. And she's like, you know, it, it said no one remembers Dory Funk Jr. No one remembers Terry Funk. No one remembers Jack Briscoe. I said, ma'am, no one, no one here remembers Bret Hart. No one here remembers Shawn Michaels. It's just, it's just a, a new audience. And I guess that's just the way it is. And, and if, if Bret Hart might as well be in the stone age for these people, you know, God help Dory Funk Jr. That's true. You got, you got different levels of uh, how far you're frozen beneath the earth's surface at this point. And yeah, I mean, just, just through the passage of time, Bret and, and, and Shawn are firmly encased, but, yeah, Dory and and Harley Race, uh, you know, they're 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 even deeper at this point. It's a shame. It is, and just you know, I, I get it. Time rolls on. I'll tell you what, we have time to take a few questions. If you haven't joined the Facebook page, this is why you should join because we're taking questions from our uh, Stick to Wrestling universe on WrestleMania 14. And Greg, since you're the guest, I'll tell you what. Would you please pick a question first? Okay, let's let's see. The Good Doctor, Nick uh, Coliatis, uh, was Mike Tyson's involvement in WrestleMania 14 the most significant celebrity appearance in wrestling history? Where would I rank it? Okay, thank you, Dr. Nick, for the question. Uh, I, I definitely will answer this later. I want to tell my Mike Tyson story because it was pivotal in my experience and probably what got me on this podcast to begin with. So as, as I told you, John, I was ringside for this WrestleMania. I was in the third row. And I felt that I was uh, deigned by God to be in Boston for this very moment, uh, because at the time I was a first year law student, but I was also uh, aspiring in the indie uh, wrestling federations throughout New England. Uh, and I had just started, I believe I was ring announcing at that time. Nice. But I thought, you know, as a as a 22 year old, uh, what way, better way to get noticed in the business than uh, as ringside in the biggest show of, of the year. And true answer is there's lots of ways, better ways to get noticed, but um, that involved school and developmental and things like that. But this is what I had. So I went in full gimmick. I wore a gold cape. You can see me on this show throughout it, uh, you know, because I was, I was ringside next to the aisle. And uh, what, uh, what my gimmick was for this show was that I brought a dry erase board. Which and, they, uh, and anyone that sees shows in the late '90s knows there are signs everywhere. Yes. Everybody's making a sign, and I thought it would be interesting, at least to me, if uh, with a dry erase board I could make a different sign for each match. And I was—that's exactly what I did. You know, my sign for the Undertaker Kane match was Kane's, Kane is my dentist. You know, I, I had some unseemly reference to China during the Triple H match, but. Um, I was standing close enough to the ring and I'm loud enough that I could yell at the performers and they could, they could hear me. And so the main event comes, Mike Tyson is coming down the aisle and before everybody else. And he's coming down. I, I erased what I had prior to it and I created my sign for Mike Tyson. And that was Mike Tyson can't read this sign. Ah, <laughs> okay and i get up i stand up on my chair i scream hey mike and i swear to god as mike tyson is climbing into this ring you can you can see him and I have, and as you established prior this was not cuddly homing pigeon raising cannabis magnate one man show mike tyson this was convicted rapist Ear biting, fearsome Mike Tyson. That's who I was telling. That's who I was basically saying was illiterate. Mike Tyson can't read the sign. He is climbing into the ring. I scream at him, Hey, Mike, you can watch him look out into the crowd and then do a double take and stare at me directly. And all that's going through my mind at that point is, Holy shit, Mike Tyson can read. <laughs> You're going to be doing your lawyer in a wheelchair. I there are not many people in this world who have stared death straight in the eye, John McCann, <laughs> and lived to tell the tale. But I am one such man, and 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 this podcast is now proof of my tale. 
because Mike Tyson, I thought for that split second, was going to crush my face in. So he earned his spot there. Uh, I I have a split second of, of time that gives me a chill anytime I watch it. Thank you for uh, inspiring me to rewatch it because I felt that all all anew uh, last night. But as far as the question goes, Mike Tyson, to me, was the most significant celebrity involvement this side of WrestleMania 1. I would rank him behind both Cindy Lauper and Mr. T, but I would rank him ahead of anybody else I can think of because he gave that show and the WWF at the time a degree of uh, legitimacy and press that that no one else has since, uh, I, I feel. You have much higher level celebrities. You know, you have Donald Trump and 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 some... Uh, and Snooky, and and I, I'm putting them on the same level purposely, but they, you know, <laughs> they have, you know, they they aired, they got some publicity towards the WWF, but not a degree of legitimacy that they were looking for, like Mike Tyson did. All right, I, I suddenly have a lot to say here. I read Mike Tyson's book, and he, as he was being let out of prison. One of the guards was like, man, I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm surprised you made it. I'm surprised you survived this. And Tyson's like, I grew up in the Bronx in the 70s and early 80s. This place was nothing. We're talking about a federal <laughs> penitentiary. And Mike's just laughing at it. Like, yeah, I grew up in the Bronx. This is nothing. There was a lot of talk 25 years ago about. Oh, well, Vince, I guess Vince can afford Mike Tyson, but he couldn't afford Bret Hart. And it was like because Mike Tyson brought a whole lot more eyeballs to the table than Bret Hart ever would have. I mean, Mike Tyson was literally a household name. You couldn't not know who Mike Tyson was. And by having him on this show, you know, it, it got you a lot of attention, a lot more buy rates. ESPN was covering it, etc. I mean, it's just there's no comparison. It was the difference between wrestling and sports entertainment right there. And that was as indicative of the direction that Vince wanted to take as, as you could find. I agree. And I agree too, that Mr. T was the biggest celebrity involvement. I mean, he was in the match. He was fighting. He was not quite the name Tyson was, but he was a big name. And people thought that Mr. T was a, a legit tough guy, which I'm sure he was just not compared to Paul Orndorff or Roddy Piper. No, uh, no, cer- certainly true. I mean, at, at his peak, Mr. T, Mr. T was a was a huge name, and just his connection through the whole through all of Cindy Lauper's work, you know, with the rock and wrestling connection and everything on on happening on MTV. I thought that that was a a bigger push into the greater public consciousness than what Tyson did. But I mean, that Tyson's involvement was was almost as consequential. No, I, I agree with you. I'll, I'll do a question from Ian Totten. Was this the most important WrestleMania of the modern post-WrestleMania 3 era? In my opinion, it was. In my opinion, this WrestleMania kind of took the WWF's feet out of the fire because, you know, we haven't talked much about this, but, you know, there was a big, big war going on between WCW and the WWF. And I think this, it, it didn't, they didn't surpass WCW uh, in terms of ratings yet, but th- this is the show that told you that they were well on their way. And I-, I thought it was a turning point in the war. It was like, you know, a-, a year ago, I was wondering, you know, is the WWF going to go out of business? Is, you know, TBS going to buy this company and merge it with WCW or something along those lines? Is Vince McMahon going to have to sell these this thing? And to me, the show was, you know, answered that question that no WWF was was strong and was, was going to remain strong. Yeah, the uh, you know at, at the time, especially when uh, Brett uh, was being signed to WCW, there was a lot of word out there. I remember reading, you know, off of off of the Meltzers uh, of the world that uh, the WWF's blood was starting to drip, and you know that was the prevailing sentiment at the time. But it could not have been less true. It was just a turn of the page. And and this show was that turn of the page. I don't know if it, I mean, for me, I don't know if it's bigger than WrestleMania 3 or the biggest. It, would, it might be the biggest since WrestleMania 3, but I liken it to more to WrestleMania 1 being you know a launch. Yes. Uh, you know, WrestleMania 3 was the, was the apex of that initial launch. This was, I mean, it's it's interesting how similar it is because WrestleMania 14 was was that 
a similar kind of launch. And I would say WrestleMania 17 was the apex of, of that era. You took the words out of my mouth. I was just about to make the comparison because you're right. The, both of these were launches and three was the apex and X7 was the apex. Yeah, yeah, that 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 definitely was uh, what was the height that 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 era would reach. Uh, so, you know, but and also, you know, 14, that was the best. I mean, we, we didn't do a summation here, but I, I felt that that was the best WrestleMania since 10. I'd say. Uh, and it was the best WrestleMania until 17. So it really stood out in that way. You know, I want to thank everyone who's listening that has listened to the past three episodes. Uh, you know, this is our last WrestleMania episode for a while, but WrestleMania, you know, WrestleMania 9 overall, I did not think was a good show. WrestleMania 4 overall, I thought was a terrible show. I thought this was a good show. I finally got to enjoy yeah. watching wrestling on a Saturday. So it, overall grade, I would give give this one. I, you know what? I'll go out and give it an A minus because, you know, again, it, it established Steve Austin as the top guy in the in the company, something that they had been waiting to do for a while. It almost felt like they waited too long, but I understand why they, they did things the way they did. Yeah, no, it was a it was an excellent coronation of Steve Austin. Uh, it was the moment that that you'd been waiting for. I would rate this on the you know in the top third of WrestleMania certainly an A minus. I think is a fair grade for it. There's no classic match uh, on this card. There's no match that I would put in my my top ten uh, necessarily. But everything was fun. The only poor match I felt was the Battle Royal at the start. You know, but everything from that point on, you know, served a purpose and and was enjoyable to watch and and had something that was memorable about it. No, there was, you know, I agree with you that there's not that one match of the year candidate or anything like that. Uh, Probably nothing in the top 10 for the year, even domestically, but it was still a good show. It, It, you know, there were enough good matches. The only match that I really looked at and said, oh, you know, this match sucks is the Battle Royal. So again, nothing, you know, nothing too far down the line as far as being bad, nothing being great, but it all worked out. It was, it was an excellent two and two and a half hour presentation. Right. Yeah. And I think it also helped that it was, you know, it was I, I didn't count up the matches, but it was it was maybe eight, eight matches total, eight or nine. And they kept them. They kept them short. They were able to move. There's a good flow between for match to match the, the vignettes at the start. Uh, the recaps were not you know, in, internal. Uh, so those all of that helped. And it, it was just a fun show. It was a fun show to be at. I remember it at the time. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed watching it again. Yeah, I, I I occasionally kick myself for not going and just you know being able to say okay I've I've been to a WrestleMania it would have been pretty simple I don't know, I don't know why my enthusiasm wasn't where it should have been because I was watching and enjoying the WWF at this time and I, I couldn't believe I was saying it I was like my God I like the WWF more than I like WCW it, it was it was just you know one of those who am I moments. Yeah, you didn't necessarily at the time. You didn't necessarily know the direction it was going to take and how they were going to execute it. But uh, you know that their mission statement from that point on was clear, and uh, it was. You know, I was definitely happy to be there. It, it got me my my lifetime story. You know, my my vendetta with Mike Tyson, and uh, you know, uh, we're, we're still we're still alive to tell the tale. I would also <laughs> say that Mike Tyson, when you ask him, I mean, he, in doing it, he was clearly a fan. And, oh, yeah. and I would dare say, I would dare say that he would be a fan of this podcast because that's his era. Uh, whenever he would reference what he liked, it would be Don Leo, Jonathan, you know, Bruno. Uh, I think he was like a, I think he's the one Nikolai Volkov fan. So yeah, he, he definitely would be, you know, this, this should be in his wheelhouse. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember he, well, he talked about wrestling in his book, and when they had him on Raw and they had him on live, they're like, oh, Mike, you're a big wrestling fan. He's like, oh, yeah, I love Bruno San Martino. I love Chief J. Stromo. And he's talking about, guys, you're absolutely not sp- – you were not supposed to say right, Bruno's right. name. I yes, everybody that. that's on the band list. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, Bruno was the one guy, but, like, you know, he was the – a totally on the outs with the WWF and Mike Tyson starts raving about him on TV. I thought that was fantastic. Greg, I'll tell you what can, I know we're going a little bit over, but I'd like to get one more question. in. can you, can you pick one out, please? Sure. Sure. I can. Uh, 
Oh, Sonny Martinez. Uh, if Montreal never happens and we get Hart Austin for the title, what do you do with Shawn Michaels? This is an excellent question because uh, I, I definitely think that if Hart was there, you'd have to do that rematch. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to do the yeah the Austin rematch, and that, that would be the proper coronation of Steve Austin, would be Bret Hart putting him over. But Shawn Michaels then is kind of left standing there. I, I'm going to accept this question you know, under the idea that he's healthy, can work a good match. Um, I would say, and I, I indicated this as we we're going through the show, I would have done, I would have tried to do so, a lot more with Ken Shamrock. It's fantasy booking, and it always frustrated me that Ken Shamrock had everything that you'd want uh, except the promo ability, and they never tried to fill that gap. And especially when you had, you had Jim Cornette right there. Um, I would have taken it a step further. And you didn't know necessarily at the time what was going on with Sonny, but this is fantasy booking extraordinaire. I would have put Sonny with Ken Shamrock and let that dynamic take over. And you could create an entire storyline from HBK bad-mouthing Sonny, referencing his own Sunny days, and someone defending her honor. And and there's there's your match. That no. that that would that would launch uh, Ken Shamrock into that level and it might not last for very long, but for that show, I think that would have worked. That is a very interesting perspective. I like what you came up with because yeah, I would say the same thing, like with complete fantasy booking without anything else getting in the way, which it often does. I mean, you would want Bret Hart to be the opponent for Steve Austin, the, the rematch from the WrestleMania before, where Bret Hart won the match. Uh, now Bret's the champion. The, the rematch with Steve Austin would be perfect. So, guys, I want to thank everyone who asked a question. I'm sorry if we didn't get them all in. But, yeah, th- this wraps up WrestleMania uh, until next year. We are going to do something we haven't done for a long time. We're going to have an extra innings segment. We're going to talk a little baseball. So if that's not your thing, thank you for re- listening to the wrestling segment, and we'll see you next week. But with that, I want to bring on our producer, Lou Kippelman. Lil, I would like you to join us for this segment. Well, hello there. (laughs) All right. Yeah, Greg is going to talk about the five top guys that he thinks should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame but are not. We are staying away from third rail candidates like Barry Bonds and Pete Rose, which I could go on and on about. But, uh, Greg, who is your number five? Okay, so my number five... I'm going to go. I'm going to start with Kenny. Lo- I'm going to lead off with Kenny Lofton. He stood out to me from the '90s, uh, you know, high power era because he was the one speed guy. He had six years of at least 54 steals. Uh, he topped out at 75 and was the table setter for all those, you know, really awesome hitting Indians teams. You know, he was hurt by just hanging around too long and having too many average years in the in the second half of his career. But he's still, you know, if you look, he had he was a career, you know, almost 300 hitter. Uh, and, and he stood out. And that's what I think the Hall of Fame stands for. I don't know if I would put Kenny Lofton in the Hall of Fame. But I do remember him almost pretty much being traded up uh, straight up for David Justice. And I was yes. like, what are they thinking? Who thinks David Justice is, is anywhere near as valuable as a player as, as Kenny Lofton? I mean, we're going back – you know, over 25 years, but I just remember being taken aback by that trade and just being like, you know, wow, Kenny Lofton is, is really, I hate to use the word underrated, but he was and, and underappreciated. Lou, what do you think? Oh, well, Lofton was a guy who, huh, would you consider him a five tool player? I'm not sure. I know he had the speed. He had a hell of a glove. He was on the Giants for a nanosecond, I think. Yeah, I, I think all things considered, I'd, uh, I'd say he's definitely, you could make a case for him as Greg is doing. I think he's from the, the Tim Raines, uh, you know, line of uh, of advocacy uh, in that he was, he, he could do all things. He wasn't really a power hitter. That's the one thing that he didn't have for him, but he was, he was a straw that stirred the drink. Uh, he, he made things go and was the key to really good offenses throughout, throughout the 90s. 
March 25th, 1997, so 26 years ago, it was traded by the Cleveland Indians with Alan Embry for Marquis Grissom, who was not that good, and David Justice. And yeah, like I said, I couldn't, I was stunned. It was a big trade, but I was stunned by it. I was like, okay, you know, do these guys know, know how good Kenny Lofton is? But I'm looking at the similarity scores on baseball. Uh, reference here and not too many of the guys who are comps to Kenny Lofter are in the Hall of Fame but the number two comp is Tim Raines who I clearly think is a Hall of Famer and is a Hall of Famer and the next comp down is Ken Griffey Sr. Or the next guy I'm familiar with who clearly isn't. Brett Butler was an excellent player but he's not a Hall of Famer. Each row is number 10. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. I mean ultimately he wouldn't get my vote but I, I appreciate what an outstanding player Kenny Lofton was. I, I think in that era you're struggling with like all the folks that are you know borderline steroids uh, users and you know, Lofton is not one that you have to worry about as far as that goes. Hey, let, let, let's talk about steroid users in the Hall of Fame right now. There are people out there who will just go nuts at the idea of Barry Bonds being in the Hall of Fame because he cheated. But Pete Rose, oh, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Who? Let me ask you. Let me, I'm asking the audience a serious question. Do you think Pete Rose used steroids? Do you think he would? Do you think he lived with a steroid dealer? That's a fact. And there are pictures of Pete Rose uh, late in his career when he was with the Phillies where he had that Michelin man look. And I'm, I'm being totally serious. I am telling my stick to wrestling audience right now. I think Pete Rose was using steroids. You know who else I think was using steroids? Get ready for this one. In 1979, Fred Lynn. Yeah, I said the I said the name Fred Lynn had this wow. huge season. And why was he having the huge season? Well, on the off season, according to Fred, he bought a Nautilus machine. And well, look at the results we're having now. If you're using a Nautilus machine to train for baseball, it helps you. It would help your uh, musculature if you use steroids. I'm not saying I'm, I'm saying I think Pete Rose used steroids. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure. I'm saying I'm not saying Fred Lynn used them. I'm saying it's a real possibility. And if he did what he did 30 years after he did it, everyone would have been accusing him of being on steroids. I think that's fair. I think that whether he was using steroids or not, I don't have a problem with him still being out of the Hall of Fame just on account of the gambling uh, issue. Uh, so I, I'm I'm going to stay hard line with that. But, um, you know, it's it's an entire era of baseball. And if they weren't using steroids, they were using something else that also was probably in a gray area. Uh, you know, the yeah. like the greenies or the amphetamines or or any of that. And it's it's a very slippery slope once you start leaving people in or out, you know, on, on account of what, what chemicals they were putting inside their bodies. I agree with you. I think I, I think you use the proper term. It's a slippery slope. Uh, I am with you that I am one of those people who think Pete Rose absolutely should never get into the Hall of Fame. Uh, there's one rule you can't break. Don't bet on baseball. It's that simple. And right. he did it. He got caught doing it. He eventually admitted doing it. And that's it. That's the punishment. You get. don't get into the Hall of Fame. Another right. guy who I will never get behind getting into the Hall of Fame is Shoeless Joe Jackson. Shoeless Joe got, went into a courtroom, and under oath, he testified that he accepted money to throw the World Series. And then he tries this, like, wink, wink, well, no, listen, here's what I really did. And it's like, no, you you accepted money to throw the games. You're done. You're out of here. Yeah, it's it's easy to create a mythology of – of of a someone that was pressured into something or like some some kind some kind of peripheral reason to do what he did, but you got to believe that uh, you know that Judge Landis or or whoever was dealing with the facts at the time, you know, had reason enough. They did not have anything to gain by throwing out a super talented baseball player at the time that they needed them, you know, from from the game itself. So I, I don't. It, I don't have a hard time believing that he was guilty as charged and, and, you know, deserves his punishment. I, I agree. And I, I forget who it was that he dealt with directly. I think it was lucky Luciano. 
And Shoeless Joe would tell anyone who would listen that, no, I was I was really trying in the World Series. I wasn't going to double cross Lucky Luciano. Like, yeah, right. Good luck. We'll see where they find you after you cross that guy. That's right. That's right. I would have been playing in the Meadowlands, uh, just like Jimmy Hoffa. (laughs) All right. Number four. I'm interested in this. Okay. So number four, and I hate saying this uh, because I don't like the person. Kurt Schilling is a Hall of Famer, though. Many dominant years, over over twenty in the major leagues. Great strikeout, like the 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 stats beyond your your win loss record. Uh, you know your your next level stats uh, support his case. He brought brought like three teams to relevance: Phillies, and then championships to the Red Sox and Diamondbacks. Not counting that bloody sock garbage, I won't even I won't even give that any credence by by discussing it. But uh, you know he's victimized by politics and ugly viewpoints. I wouldn't want to hear his speech. But he deserves the plaque, nonetheless. Lou, what are your thoughts? Mm, I'm a, of a similar mind as as Greg is. If, if we're talking excluding assholes from the Baseball Hall of Fame, I think Schilling and Jim Bunning would be right up there for me. But I, I think his his career numbers, what he brought as a pitcher to various teams, including the Diamondbacks, and the Astros, and the Red Sox. I think they all make a, a solid case for him getting in the hall. I think his numbers are borderline, and I'm a Red Sox fan, so if I'm on a jury here, I mean, I, my vote is disallowed. I'm not allowed on the jury because I am a Red Sox fan. I think if not for the bloody sock game, he doesn't get in, but he's a little bit like Jack Morris, where he's not quite in, except he's got this one thing. Jack Morris threw 11, inning, uh, 11 shutout innings in the 1987 World Series yeah. Game 7. To me, that puts him over the top. To me, the bloody sock game puts Kurt Schelling over the top. And if you guys want to laugh, I was adamantly against the Red Sox trading for Kurt Schilling and and giving him big money. And the reason behind it, one of the players that the Red Sox gave up to obtain him, I was really high on. I really liked Casey Fossum. And I'm like, yeah, why are you Ah. trading? Yeah, why are you trading one thing for another? And uh, I mean, just, hey, don't let me run your team. That's all I've got to say. I got you. Were, were you a uh, Brian Rose fan? Uh, you know who I, I remember Peter Gammons, uh, uh, you know, discussing ad nauseum in his in his weekly Boston Globe columns. I oh, I'll tell you what. I liked Brian Rose, but it, he's who he's who the Red Sox traded for for Pedro Martinez, right? Oh boy, <laughs> is that right? I I'm, you, I'm, you, you got me on that one. Uh, it could have been it could have been Brian Rose. It could have been Dana Kicker. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's Wasn't plenty kicking. that could have gone down that route. <laughs> but uh, whoever they traded for Pedro, it was a good trade. <laughs> Let's all I'll put it that way. I, I was saying that at the time. I'm like, I was like, you know, neither one. They traded one of their top pitching candidates for Pedro Martinez, and I was like, the the best the best case scenario is this guy turns out to be as good as Pedro Martinez, and he never did. And yeah, he got traded. He got traded to the I Mets. I know who it was. It was Carl Pavano. Carl Pavano, thank you. Yeah, Rose and Pavano were kind of like the same guy in the Red Sox farm system, and I get them mixed up. But, yeah, they, I mean, Pedro Martinez, I, I was thrilled to get. Kurt Schilling, I was not when it happened, but obviously in the back end, I was. I wound up very happy that we had Kurt Schilling. And, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to look past some of his shenanigans and just say, hey, as a player, he's a Hall of Famer. So, Greg, who's your number three? Number three, I have Andrew Jones. This is another you know, great player that just hung around too, too long. 434 home runs, 10 gold gloves. Uh, he had a 50 home run year. You know, there's there's two types that seem to be, there's two kind of trajectories that are on this fringe Hall of Fame uh, route. Uh, they're either the players that were very good, for a very, very long time, you know, the kind of stats accumulator players like like Eddie Murray, I'd say. And then you have the players that were really, really great for, you know, a handful of years. And then, you know, maybe below average for a number of years on the tail end. That's Andrew Jones here. But I feel like his his brightest of bright spots are are far, far more uh, luminous 
than his his down years at the tail end. Uh, he should definitely, between the defense and, and the power hitting, he should be in the hall. Lou, give us your thoughts on Andrew Jones. Yeah, Andrew Jones is just one of those guys. I'm looking at his career stats and season by season uh, as a power hitter. He was just, with the sole, the exception of that sole season on the Dodgers, he is just somebody who could clout the ball. He was somebody who really had powerful, powerful stats in terms of homers, in terms of RBI for a number of years. All those, the, that consistently almost boring rote winning streak that, that the, the Braves have had <laughs> in the late nineties through the, the two thousands. And then finally wound up with a, a, a few middling years of, well, let's see, with, I didn't know he was on the Yankees. Yankees, White Sox, Rangers. Yeah, he had a cup of coffee on the Yankees. Okay. So, you know, he's somebody, yeah, he definitely dazzled defensively. Home runs, he was more or less dependable, especially in the early part of his career. So I'd say it's a borderline case, but I, I think I'd lean towards yes. Andrew Jones was one of the best players in baseball for a, a pretty good chunk of time. And we talk about him, you know, winning gold gloves. I, I don't always take gold gloves that seriously in a Hall of Fame discussion because sometimes the, the voting is a little bit skewed. You know, who got it last year? Okay, I'll just vote for that guy this year. Andrew Jones does not fall into that category. Andrew Jones was an elite defender at an elite defensive position. He was an, an an all-world center fielder. He wasn't just some guy who won a couple of gold gloves at, at first base or third base. This guy was amazing. I think he falls a little bit short. Now, I, it makes me sad to say that because I remember 2008 when he signed with the Dodgers after coming off a little bit of a down season with the with the Braves, and, and he could not make contact with the ball. He was just terrible. He hit 158 that year, and – it, it might have gotten worse if the Dodgers hadn't benched him. Um, but I'm I'm talking about something that, that's a little bit sad as opposed to what a great player he was in, you know, the in from like ninety nine until two thousand seven. He was a great player. Ultimately to me he would fall a little bit short, but I give that guy a lot of credit. He was he was a great player or, uh, for a long time. So who's your number two, Greg? Number two. Okay, so I'm going to go to San Francisco and uh, and Jeff Kent. Barry Bonds' sigma is such that he took Jeff Kent with him because offensively he's he's an all time all time offensive player at second base and he's a former MVP at that. More than a hundred home runs than Ryan Sandberg. So if you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it on the on the high end. If Scott Rowland or Craig Biggio is in, I don't know how you leave him out. On a low end. I'd say, well, he's three times the player that Harold Baines is. But, uh, you know, they're, they're better men than me to, to take up that argument. Lou, give us your thoughts on Jeff Kent, former Dodger and Giant. Yeah, I think you could probably guess where my opinion lies on this. The guy was just uh, really had some great monster seasons, including the NL MVP season amongst, you know, other tremendous players like Barry Bonds. This is a guy who, for whatever defensive shortcomings he may have had, he was, for his position, quite the offensive spark plug. So it is a mystery to me how he's been kind of overlooked through recent years of elections. I think he's in, I think he's in Barry Bonds' shadow. Oh, while we're talking about that, Lou, but let me ask you if you know something about this. Wasn't there like a mega feud between uh, Barry Bonds and Jeff Kent? Didn't they hate each other? Well, they did have like one dust up in the dugout. But honestly, you could say everybody versus Barry Bonds on <laughs> those Giants teams. This is the guy really? who had the recliner. His locker room had the recliner and the big screen TV. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> no, he was not a well-loved 
player in the clubhouse, I would think, by any stretch. Jeff Kent, you know, was was a notorious red ass on the field, and he could, you know, definitely rub people the wrong way. But yeah, Barry Bonds was no Mister Mister Congeniality on the Giants either. I knew someone who worked for one uh, one of Barry Bonds' agents, and he knew Barry Bonds a little bit, and he said Barry Bonds was a really good guy. I don't know what else to say. It was one person I know who had multiple interactions with Barry Bonds, and he said Barry was fine. Yeah, and I think that, that's you know, one guy. <laughs> well, yeah, and I and I think since uh, you know he retired. And the cream in the clear uh, usage dropped off. I think he is significantly mellowed. He currently lives in the town where I grew up in Tiburon, California, just north of San Francisco. And, you know, he just seems to be a rather mellow kind of affable guy nowadays. He showed up at opening day for the Tiburon Peninsula Little League this past season. So whatever inner demons... Uh, he he had been fighting during his career. I, I think he makes a, a really good retired player now. The first time I had ever heard of Barry Bonds was I read, I believe, in Baseball America about Bobby Bonds, his dad, driving his uh, Mercedes onto the field at, during an Arizona State practice and you know arguing with the coach about something. The guy's got his car on the diamond. And because his son, Barry, was not getting enough playing time. That's the first time I heard of him. And this is probably back in like 85 or so. Well, well, Bobby Bonds, uh, (laughs) boy, he had a lot of DUI trouble. So uh, (laughs) having him behind a car period was not a good thing. Oh, man. I remember thinking that the Yankees were crazy for trading him uh, just for Mickey Rivers and Ed Figueroa. Like, once again, don't let me run your team. I agree that Jeff Kent is a Hall of Famer. He played 17 years. He played good for second base and has a career slugging percentage of exactly 500. I have always advocated for Jeff Kent being in the Hall of Fame, a, a middle infielder, who defends well and hits as well as Kent did, I I absolutely believe belongs in the Hall of Fame. Who's your number one? Okay, my number one, by far the most egregious, is Tommy John. It's worth it on numbers alone, 288 wins when that actually mattered. Quality pitcher well into his 40s. He spanned eras from the mid-60s to late 80s. He played in a league with Mickey Mantle. He played in a league with Barry Bonds. Uh, So, you know... Career-wise, statistically, that's enough for me. But even if he was just average, if he had an Andy Hawkins or a Dave LaPointe type career, he should just get in for pioneering the surgery. The Tommy John surgery has saved careers of hundreds and hundreds of pitchers. Almost everyone has it these days. I think Frank Job, the surgeon that performed the surgery, should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, But by either contribution, Tommy John deserves to have that recognition if you combine both, I don't see how he's left out. That is an excellent argument. What are your thoughts, Lou? Yeah, Tommy John is one of those players who name gets thrown around medically every year for the UCL surgery. But taking a look at his career, 26 seasons, we're talking Phil Necro, Hoyt Wilhelm type longevity or Don Sutton, or whomever, and a total of 231 career wins, career ERA of 3.34, and let's see, how many strikeouts? He he was a ground ball pitcher. His strikeout numbers aren't going to be that impressive. I'm still here. I'm just looking at his numbers, and (laughs) there's a lot of numbers to go through. (laughs) Yeah, no shortage. Oh, why he started in 1963 and he finished in 1989. That is truly amazing. And if you look at the comps given by baseball reference, okay, and I know these aren't, you know, the, Moses didn't come down from the mountain with these comps. I get it. But number one, Jim Cott, Hall of Famer. Number two, Robin Roberts, no question, Hall of Famer. Number three, Absolutely. Bert Blylevin. 
in my opinion, no no questions asked, Hall of Famer. People argue about Bly Levin, they're wrong. He was great. Jenkins in. Or Fergie Jenkins, excuse me. By the way, did you guys know they talked about Fergie Jenkins in This Is Spinal Tap, but they cut it out? <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not joking. If anyone's listening to this, just put in Spinal Tap Fergie Jenkins uh, into YouTube. It'll come out. It's hilarious. I don't know how this didn't make it into the movie. Our early wins, clearly a Hall of Famer. But Rick and Mass's Tom Glavin is number six, c- clearly a Hall of Famer. Uh, Tony Milan is not. Don Sutton is his next comp. Don Sutton is, in my opinion, clearly a Hall of Famer. And none of these guys had Tommy John surgery named after them. So I agree with you. He's he's absolutely a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I just, I mean, just on the just as a pioneer, I, I think that qualifies him as a pioneer, and that that should that should get him in. The fact that he had any career after having what was at that time a drastic drastic surgery it g- gives him tremendous credit in my book. But you know, he he was the first of his kind. I remember reading about the surgery and how radical the surgery was. They took what is that muscle tendon from a dead body and they put it into a live body. It made the arm work again. So many uh, players, pitchers, careers could have been saved by this. Had it been invented 10, 20, 30 years later, earlier, excuse me. I was a Yankee fan in the mid eighties. And I remember him on that, on those teams. And he would celebrate the birthday of that tendon in his arm. Like, and and (laughs) by, by then it was like, he was almost having his uh, his arms bar mitzvah, so it just tells you, uh, just, you know how how, how long and, and just how wild that was at the time. Greg, thank you for coming on, and taking the time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and you were great on the show. Hey, thank you, John, so much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, huge fan, and I will continue to be so. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. And the I believe this episode will be called "The Man in the Gold T- Gold Cape." <laughs> Wow. All right. I want to thank an honor. Definitely. Greg, thanks for being on. I want to thank everyone for listening. I want to thank uh, Brian Last uh, for giving me this forum. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all of the great work that he does. And we'll see you next week. This has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Vols, please survive this weekend. This concludes our podcast day.